watch some clips. We kind of wanted, we were watching some clips. Actually, one of them, this first one was sent to us. And then we kind of went down the rabbit hole a little bit. But this was a, a Dave Ramsey clip. And it's about 401k plans. And are they a good idea? We'll watch a little bit more of this and get into this. Because he's going to talk about, so the investments within the account are what determine the growth of the account. Right? So he's covered that. That's true. But what he's missing is uh, a couple other components to that. We have is an underperforming investment in your 401k. Does that make sense? Um, sort of. And what do you mean by that? Like, like okay, pretend like, there's a cookie, pretend, like, pretend like there's a cookie jar. And that's the investment mm -hmm. with the cookies. The cookies in the cookie jar are either good or bad. The jar doesn't determine that. The jar is just where you park the cookies. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. You can have peanut butter cookies, you could have sugar cookies, you could have chocolate chip cookies, and they could be good cookies or they could suck. But the jar didn't cause any of that to happen. The jar is just where you have them. The 401k is the jar. The investment is the cookies. So we basically, three places I worked at, they didn't really have the right investment. Or you didn't pick the right, right ones from the ones that they offered. Right. There was four on each one of them. No, there was four. There was four general portfolios on each one of them, and you picked the wrong portfolio. But you probably could have gone even inside of those four portfolios, meaning they had a they had a uh, low risk, a medium risk, and a high risk, or something like that. And uh, that high risk would have had a group of mutual funds in it that would have sounded a lot like what we tell you to do, and you would have done a lot better had you been in that versus the one you were in. And so, what you're looking for is you're looking for mutual funds inside the 401k, whether there's a match or not. A match is helpful, obviously, because it's freaking free money. But you're looking for mutual funds inside the 401k that have a good long term track record. And I personally, in my 401k or my business, do this, and I recommend that other people do the same thing that you put it in four types of mutual funds growth, growth and in income, aggressive growth, and international. And that's the cookies. Okay. okay. That's the. So here's where I'm going to disagree with Dave a little bit. Um, so here's how it works within a 401k. Okay. So the 401k gives you investment options within it. Okay. Here's the thing that I don't love about 401ks is they're only required to give you, I think it's like 12 or 14 some options or different mutual funds or ETFs or whatever they're putting in there. So those are the only options you have to pick to invest from within that 401k. As opposed to when I open my IRA, it's a discount brokerage you firm. Can put just I have about, every option under the sun. Right. And just about any market you, you want to touch, you can you can put in. Uh, you used to be able to, like in the old days, in the 80s, you used to be able to put your house in your, in your 401k or your IRA. Not your 401k, your IRA. Sorry. So like, like, I don't know if you guys remember Mitt Romney when he ran for president against Barack Obama. This was back, what, 2012? And that came out of it, Mitt Romney that he had like two or three other houses that he owned and they were in his IRA and it was grandfathered in. You can't do that anymore. But the beauty thing about that is he could put his houses in the IRA and now they're tax deferred. <laughs> right? Wow. So he dodged it. So imagine owning a home and you don't have to pay taxes on it because it's in your IRA. You don't have to pay any of the homeowners tax, any of that stuff. And your state. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. But here's the deal. So he's going into this. Okay, you have those options. And then typically what they'll do is they'll put together like a minimum of like three portfolios. One's going to be low risk, medium and high risk. And those are going to be the three. If you're younger, you're probably going to be looking at the higher risk kind of stuff. You can pick individual funds or you can pick one of those three portfolios. Most people pick one of those three. You have to understand, though, since you only have these limited options with a 401k, most of it is based on US market, almost entirely. They don't go very far beyond it. So if the market has a couple bad years, you're gonna have bad years in your 401k. That's what Dave is missing. He's sitting there, oh, you picked the underperforming fund. Well, you didn't have a lot of options. And I bet you all the funds in there underperformed <laughs> because the market underperformed. It's also possible, honestly, that it could have been a little of column A and a little of column, column B. B. It's possible that this person really didn't really even understand how to read the charts when they were picking, and maybe they picked kind of the worst of the worst, really. Yeah. But also that it was a bad year where everything underperformed. So it's kind of hard to say without a little more information. Right. Well, it seems like what he did was he picked one of the portfolios. 
So you're, you're younger. That's fine. Cause most people don't understand this stuff. And honestly, as a financial planner, um, if you come to me and ask me to invest your 401k, I'm going to sit there and go, well, you're not a client. If you're paying me, I might do it for you, but I'm doing it for free because I'm not managing that money. So I'm not getting paid to pick your investments for you, right? Even though I'm going to pick the, the lowest risk for the highest potential return based on those whatever 14 options I have, right? But one of those mm -hmm. things where it's like, if you go to a financial advisor about it, we're not getting paid. So most of the time we're going to tell you to get lost because why am I working for free for you? <laughs> you know, I got to eat too, man. <laughs> can't, you can't go to an attorney and go, well, can't you just do a pro bono? No, <laughs> can't. Sorry. Not even your doctor does it pro bono. The other thing I think is funny is he talks about the difference between growth and value funds, right? And it talks about stocks and, and funds, but growth funds invest in what are called growth stocks. And growth stocks are basically stocks that are, we think are priced correctly in the market, but we think have a lot of earning potential, right? So they tend to have what's called a high PE ratio. Um, and I can show you this real quick, just to give you guys a little, little taste when you're looking at these things, right? So let's look at, let's look at some uh, growth stock that I know of. So let's look at Netflix. So Netflix is a, a pretty common growth stock. And that's running a little slow today. There we go. So Netflix is a pretty good growth stock. So Netflix has a high PE ratio right now. It's 48.34. What does that mean? It means the price per share of Netflix, right? So right now, so the price of Netflix is $485.31. That's one share of Netflix cost $485. Okay. But this price divided by the earnings per share, which is the earnings. So if we have a million shares, right? Or let's do this easier. So Lacey, Lacey has a company, Lacey Corp. Lacey Corp issues a thousand shares and her earnings for the year were $10,000. That means her earnings per share would be 10,000 divided by a thousand. So it would be $10 per share. So that's what her, her profit was per share. And since you're the shareholder, your shares are worth, you're, you get a share of the profit. So the price divided by the earnings gives you the, the jump, right? So the price is a lot higher than the earnings, which should be a good sign. Now, in a growth stock, typically you're looking at, yeah, I want a high price to earnings ratio or PE ratio, as it's called here. I'll show you guys again. So this means that the price, and you know, you, you have to compare this to other industries. So like Netflix is entertainment communications. So you'd look at what's the average PE ratio for entertainment and communications and see how they compare. And if they're high, you might sit there and go, oh, well, it looks like they have really good growth and earnings. You could also sit there and say, well, they're high. They might be overpriced. And this is what a value investor would, would typically think, right? Because a value investor would sit there and go, well, hey, 48 and the average is, say, 30. That's really, then that means this price is way higher than it should be. Right? Which means it might be too hot. And you could be looking at, downturn going forward. So when a value investor is looking at not only when they do the breakdown of the books, just so you understand, growth investors looking for steady earnings and growth in earnings. Value investors looking at that, but they're also looking at is the are the earnings really good, but it's cheap for what it should be. Because a value right, investor, where like it looks like the price tag is looking a little low compared to what it should be. Like it's a little on sale. Right. So at a value stock, it's going to be, well, hey, the earnings are really good, but it's lower on the PE ratio than it should be. Right. Than the average should be. Right. So a value investor is looking at that going, oh, well, this is underpriced. So I can get this cheap right now. And then when the market catches up and realizes it's underpriced, now all of a sudden I'm going to see all the gains up to here, plus whatever the gains are above that. So I'm going to get all the in between. So I'm going to get a larger bump, right? 
So I'm going to show you this, guys, real quick. So this is um, da, 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 da. this is dimensional funds. This is a you have to be an advisor to invest with with these guys. Um, individual people cannot invest with them. Sorry, guys. Um, but they're run by uh, Fama and French, who came up with the oh, what was it the 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 three three structure pricing model. I forget what it is. But they have the Fama I know has a, a noble prize for it. But what, here's what they found with their investment strategy is historically value stocks have outperformed growth stocks, right, in the U.S., often by a striking amount. So they did the data back to 1927, and they found that on average, right, value stocks outperform growth stocks over the whole period of that time by an average of 4.4% a year. Now, if you go back in the last 10, 20 years, it's been about half and half. Sometimes where these yellow lines are, this is with where growth beats value. The green line is where value beats growth. So sometimes the growth stocks do better. Sometimes the value stocks do better. But statistically, overall, even if we look at you know just the last 20 years, value stocks do better overall, just in return. Now, growth stocks also do well too. But it makes sense when you're putting a portfolio together to have a bit of both because growth stocks tend to do really good in bad years or slow market years because those companies have solid earnings <laughs> and people tend to dump more money into them because they're stable and value stocks tend to remain undervalued because people don't want to take risks. But in really good years, value stocks beat the crap out of growth stocks because now people are excited and they see, oh, well, this is probably underpriced. I can get it cheap now and I can make a lot of money going forward, right? So good years, value stocks do really well. Bad years, growth stocks do a little bit better usually. So it's nice to have both in your portfolio to diversify it out. Because if you're only in growth stocks and you have a couple good years, your growth stocks are not going to perform as well. And in bad years, they're not gonna, they're not going to make up the difference. So right. for Dave to sit there and go just all in growth, it's like, I don't think Dave understands the difference between growth and value. <laughs>